Welcome back everybody to another reaction video. So this is my first recording in my new home of Canada. So I've moved here for a couple of years. Um, whether I stay here or not is up in the air at the moment, but this is the first video that I'm recording after having been settled in. So um, if anyone can hear a strange bubbling sound <laughs> in the background, I'm recording this in the living room and I've got a pot of gumbo actually bubbling away on the cooker, so um, if anyone can hear that, that's that's what that is. Uh, there's also a few animals in the room, so if you hear an occasional meow or a dog barking, <laughs> then that's why. Um, but uh, we're continuing with our look at Europe's Euro Revolutions uh, by Epic History TV. So, as always, leave a like and some comments, uh, get some discussions going for the algorithm, the more the better. And uh, let's just keep going. So let's just dive straight back in. So this is part two of our look at Epic History TV, 1848, Europe's Year of Revolutions. The first euphoric phase of the European revolutions becomes known as the springtime of the peoples. With censorship relaxed, there's an explosion in the number of newspapers among them, Cologne's radical new daily, Neue Rheinischer Zeitung, edited by Karl Marx. It feels like the dawn of a new era. But these early successes are built on the back of an uneasy alliance, as Marx is quick to highlight. Middle-class liberals want constitutions, more inclusion in politics, and a free press. Workers, who are the revolutionary foot soldiers in many cities, want cheaper food and the right to work. German radicals sum it up with a neat pun. Freedom to read versus freedom to feed. Hmm. I like that. That's a good way of sort of delineating the two. And, and it serves to kind of emphasize why, particularly revolutions in the more industrialized era, um, as opposed to, say, something like the American War of Independence, which we've discussed wasn't strictly a revolution, it was a, just a separation. Um, but it serves to delineate why these revolutions can often sort of break down and you get the conflict between the more moderates and the more radicals, um, more radical factions versus the more moderate factions, as it's often framed. Um, but... It's interesting that they've already sort of highlighted the distinction between the two there, because um, yes, for the you know for the vast majority of people that are caught up in these political struggles, that's their daily you know that's their daily fight you know is to just earn enough you know to have a good life and support the family, and just to earn enough to put food on the table versus people that are in the middle class who already have enough wealth to do that, so then they have the opportunity to pursue other pleasures, you know, like philosophizing and reading. So uh, you could say that the sort of the liberal moderate faction um, are the ones that, um, you know, have room for that philosophizing and their, their cause and their um, struggle is something that's more you know, you could argue is more abstract um, versus the majoritarian um, working class, potentially more radical factions who, you know, it's it, their concerns are much more material based. It's much, not not in a sense of like acquiring wealth or not necessarily, but just material in the sense that it's just day to day stuff, you know, just to be able to live properly. Um and you can sort of argue that, you know, one can easily complement the other, you know, that if you have these constitutions and if you have reforms in the press and reforms in laws and, and things like that and reforms in economics, it can help foster a more prosperous society to enable, you know, everyone else to be able to afford enough to live and to create job opportunities rather than having these sort of overbearing centralized monarchies. But, you know, let's... Uh, maybe getting ahead of ourselves, but let's just continue. Europe's new assemblies are under pressure from conservatives who think they're going too far and radicals and socialists who think they're not going far enough. Most horrifying of all to Europe's middle class, there hovers the threat of mass direct action, social revolution, the mob.
In the wake of the revolution, France's provisional government had set up National Workshops, a public works programme to alleviate unemployment in Paris. But just three months later, a new, more conservative government announces their closure. 100,000 workers are suddenly jobless. The response is immediate and furious. Over three days in June, Paris radicals take on the middle-class National Guard and regular troops in a bloody battle of the barricades. The Archbishop of Paris attempts to mediate, but is cut down in a crossfire. This remarkable early photograph shows some of the Paris barricades fought over that summer. And let's just take a moment to appreciate that, that this is 1848. You know, and we've already got f uh, photographs that are, I mean, the detail in that photograph is actually kind of astonishing when you think about it. Just the amount of, like, detail that it's actually captured, because we tend to think of, you know, things like the Crimean War being the, you know, which came, I think that was 1854, so not too much later, but, um, you know, we tend to think of that as the first major war that had... Photographs, you know, we have photographs of the soldiers that fought in it and things like that. And, you know, much later um, than this as well, you know, in the in the early 1860s, you get a lot of photographs coming out of the American Civil War, which was really the first mass photographed conflict. But it's just amazing to me that we have photographs from this early in such great detail. By the time it's all over, General Cavagnac's troops have killed at least 1,500 workers and arrest 12,000 more, a third of whom are deported to Algeria. He believes he has saved France from anarchy. The sacred cause of the Republic has triumphed, he declares. The French Revolution has split between left and right, with bloody consequences. It paves the way for the return of a famous name from the past, promising unity and order. That spring, conservative governments had been caught off guard by the speed of events. Now they begin to fight back. In Prague, Czech students clash with troops. The wife of Austrian commander, General Windisch Gretz, is killed by a stray bullet. He responds by withdrawing his troops and bombarding the city's old town with artillery. 43 are killed before the students surrender. In Italy, King Carlo Alberto of Piemont Sardinia has declared an Italian war of liberation against Austria and invades Lombardy Venetia. He is supported by the other Italian states and nationalist volunteers, including the Italian Legion, led by professional revolutionary Giuseppe Garibaldi. Austrian forces in Italy are commanded by 81 year old Field Marshal Radetzky, a distinguished veteran of the Napoleonic Wars. Vienna orders him to negotiate. Instead, Radetzky wages a masterful campaign, fending off the Piedmontese advance, then launching a decisive counterattack. Piedmontese forces retreat in disarray, and Carlo Alberto negotiates a truce. That summer, Johann Strauss composes the Radetzky March to celebrate the old general's victory. Meanwhile, Austrian relations with Hungary are in crisis. The country is now effectively independent, with its own elected parliament and a prime minister, Lajos Batyani. But not everyone wants to be part of the new Hungary. Savage ethnic conflicts break out between Hungarians and Romanians in Transylvania and Hungarians and Serbs in Vojvodina, leaving thousands dead. An even greater threat is Croatian General Josip Jelacic, a fire-breathing imperial loyalist 
who takes matters into his own hands and invades what he regards as a renegade province. The Emperor still hopes for a peaceful resolution, and sends a loyal general, Count Lamberg, to take command of Hungarian military forces. But on arrival, he's brutally murdered by a mob. Appalled, the Imperial government declares war on the Hungarian revolutionaries. This in turn outrages liberals and radicals in Vienna. There is fresh violence on the streets, and the Austrian Minister of War is lynched. Troops evacuate the city, while the Emperor flees to Olmutz. Jelicic marches to the government's aid. He joins forces with Windisch Greats outside Vienna, and together they bombard the city. Then they attack. The October Rising is crushed, with the loss of 2,000 lives. 25 revolutionary leaders are executed, including Robert Blum, a member of the German parliament in Frankfurt. He becomes a celebrated martyr of the revolutions. With Vienna secure, the Austrian invasion of Hungary can begin. The Hungarians are heavily outnumbered. Budapest falls, and the Hungarian government evacuates to Debrecen. Following the violence in Berlin that March, the King of Prussia withdraws to his palace at Potsdam, on the outskirts of the city. Here he is surrounded by loyal troops and conservative advisers, including a 33-year-old aristocrat named Otto von Bismarck. When asked for his view on what should be done, Bismarck says nothing but leans over to a piano and taps out the march of the Prussian infantry. The forces of conservatism are strong in Prussia. There is deep loyalty to the state and the king. And a lot of that as well comes from the victory in the Napoleonic Wars, because um, for a time, Prussia had actually been occupied by Napoleon after being pretty severely defeated. And Prussia had been like this rising star throughout the 18th century. Um, and it had become one of the most, one of the mo more powerful states in Europe. Um, particularly during the Seven Years' War. You know, the Seven Years' War it pretty much fought all of Europe single-handed, and, you know, apart from Britain, which was allied with it, and, you know, pretty successfully held it off. Um, so Prussia had always had this sort of martial prowess and this sort of proud tradition of um, sort of uh, proto-nationalistic identity before nationalism as a force started to become prominent in the 19th century. And, you know... Um, after um, Napoleon's defeat in Russia, um, the Prussians essentially broke away from the alliance and they saw that as a war of liberation, you know. So Prussia had always had this sort of firmly entrenched nationalism, you know, much earlier than you could say other nations like Italy, for example. And, you know, when you get things like the German unification later on after the Franco-Prussian War, you know, you could probably make the argument that it was more of a Prussian subsuming of the other German states than it was a unification as such. So Prussia had always had this sort of very strong identity of its own, and that's probably one of the reasons why conservatism is very strong there. Allies, like Bismarck, adopt the enemy's tactics, launching conservative political organizations and newspapers to mobilize this support. Yeah, which is a common thing that you see. So this is essentially counter-revolution. So um, again, this is some. This is very, very common throughout history. When you get um, one group that pushes for a, you know a, a series of demands, you inevitably get a reaction from the other side. So um, you know examples being the American War of Independence. Again, you know you had the patriots pushing for independence for America, and then you had um, a sizable chunk of Americans, about one-fifth of the population, um, pushing back and saying, no, we want to remain loyal to the British crown, you know, and it became a war of propaganda through both sides. You know, another example would be the Spanish Civil War, for example. You know, that's often 
you could characterize that as liberal revolution and then you know conservative counter revolution um so that's not not at all uncommon either by november king frederick william has noted the infighting of his opponents and the defeat of the vienna revolution and decides to act he orders general wrangel to lead 13,000 troops into Berlin. They enter the city unopposed and order the Prussian assembly to disperse. It has no option but to comply. Prussia will get its constitution, but it is one handed down by the king under which he retains full executive power. Prussian dreams of a true parliamentary system, even a republic, are dashed. In December, two new players take the stage, who will play key roles in shaping the fate of Europe's revolutions. In Vienna, Emperor Ferdinand abdicates in favor of his 18-year-old nephew, Franz Josef. He will reign until his death in 1916. And we all know who was going to succeed him and whose assassination paved the way for a particular bloody war around that time. In Paris, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, nephew of Emperor Napoleon, is elected President of the French Republic in a landslide victory. He promises to heal divisions, impose order, and restore France to her former glory. In Italy, the tumult continues into 1849. In the Papal States, the reforms of Pope Pius had seen him held up as an unlikely liberal role model. But escalating radicalism and violence, notably the assassination of his justice minister, Pellegrino Rossi, caused Pope Pius to flee Rome. In his absence, a Roman Republic is declared. It is led by Giuseppe Mazzini, the iconic figurehead of Italian nationalism, who's devoted his life to the unification of his homeland. But elsewhere, the Italian cause fares badly. Carlo Alberto resumes his war with Austria, with disastrous consequences. At the Battle of Novara, Radetzky inflicts another heavy defeat. Carlo Alberto abdicates in favor of his son, Vittorio Emanuele to avoid a republican revolution. Twelve years later, he'll become the first king of a modern united Italy. In the south, Ferdinand reverts to absolutist rule and sends troops to Sicily who stamp out the revolution. Then, to the dismay of liberals across Europe, French President Louis Napoleon sends troops to crush the Republic of Rome and put the Pope back on his throne. He has decided the support of French Catholics is more important to him than the fate of Italian Republicans. Yeah, which is, you could say, is something that Napoleon had to learn pretty quickly as well, because the French Revolution had been, um, and this, you know, this was obviously, you know, a good 50 years earlier, but... Um, when you look at the French Revolution, one of the things it tried to do was basically root out the power of the church in France. Um, it had been seen as this hugely corrupting influence, and to a huge degree it was. Um, but they neglected to think that these institutions and the concept of religion as a whole was still very important to people, even if the majority of people did see the institution as corrupt. <clears throat> So in trying to get rid of it, they actually ended up alienating a lot of people. And one of the things that Napoleon um, did when he uh, gained power was to try and reinstate the power of religion throughout the, um, throughout France. Um, but one area that he didn't learn that lesson was in Spain and in trying to occupy Spain and impose sort of revolution you know, French, some of the French revolutionary ideals on Spain, Spain obviously being very deeply Catholic and, you know, the Spanish 
absolute, you know, a lot of the Spanish, at least, because there were, the, you know, there was a sizable chunk of Spaniards who sided with France. Um, you know, the more liberal uh, sort of side sided with uh, France um, because of the revolutionary ideas. But you still had that sort of ca that hugely dominant Catholic population who saw France as coming to, you know, disestablish religion and attacking religion in their home. So, um you know, just purely in you know, just purely in terms of an observation, um, this was actually a really shrewd political move on his part because it secures the support of the majoritarian um, group of the population over you know the perceived needs of what he would think is a handful of you know liberal radicals essentially. So this is more of a ploy to secure his position than anything else. French forces are led by General Oudino, son of the famous Marshal. Rome's defender... Just as a side, it's interesting that we see a lot of the echoes of the Napoleonic Wars here because, you know, the Decembrists, which helped influence the era of revolutions, a lot of those were led by former Napoleonic era officers. And then here you've got the nephew of the French, the first French emperor, being elected into a position and and then you've got the son of a famous um marshal who fought with napoleon leading the troops of napoleon's nephew so it's just interesting to me that you know essentially the same class of people you know not only the same class of people but the same dynasties are still in power does are led by garibaldi but despite skilled and courageous resistance Rome is forced to surrender after a two-month siege. That summer, Radetzky also retakes Venice and puts an end to its republic. In March, the German National Parliament in Frankfurt had finally agreed on a constitution for a united Germany. It is to be a constitutional monarchy under an emperor. The man intended to play this role is Frederick William of Prussia. So when he declines the offer, the plan is killed stone dead. In public, he says it is impossible without the consent of the other German princes. In private, he says he would never accept a crown from the gutter, disgraced by the stink of revolution. Revolts in support of the national constitution break out in Saxony, the Palatinate and the Grand Duchy of Baden. They are crushed by local forces, assisted by Prussian troops. The Frankfurt Parliament itself is dissolved. What hope there had been for a united Germany under a liberal constitution lies in ruins. In Austria, the new Emperor Franz Josef issues his own new constitution, reclaiming almost all political power. He also revokes all the liberal reforms passed by the Hungarian parliament, known as the April Laws. In response, Lajos Kossuth declares formal Hungarian independence, and the country begins an extraordinary campaign of military mobilization. Hungarian commander General Gergely retakes Budapest. He then launches a bloody assault on Buda Castle, overpowering its Austrian garrison. In desperation, the Austrian Emperor travels to Warsaw to formally request military aid from the Emperor of Russia. Russian troops have already moved into Moldavia and then Wallachia to put down the Romanian liberal revolution. Nicholas now agrees to send troops to Hungary to crush those he describes as the enemies of order and tranquility. Hungary faces an impossible strategic situation, surrounded and outnumbered more than two to one. The combined onslaught is irresistible. The Hungarian forces are driven south and finally forced to surrender. In the aftermath, around 120 Hungarian politicians and army officers are executed. So ends Hungary's War of Independence.
1848 was a year like no other. A series of seismic political events following one upon another like falling dominoes. But what had been achieved? A British historian famously described 1848 as the turning point at which modern history failed to turn. And for all the euphoria of Europe's springtime of the peoples, by 1849, it seemed that the counter-revolutionaries had won everywhere. But some gains did endure, such as the abolition of serfdom in Austria and the popular vote in France, though France became a little less democratic in 1852, after Louis Napoleon made himself emperor. Across Europe, governments modernised and paid more attention to economic and social issues, partly in response to the new challenges that had emerged from socialist and working-class politics. The cause Yeah, because especially the last thing, if you're a government and you want to maintain order, the absolute last thing that you can afford is a economically active workforce in, you know, in the sense that this is a huge number of people that are active in the workplace, they're actually working, they're not subsistence farmers anymore, they're working to earn a living, so they now have a stake in the economics of the country, so they become, you know, they become politically active as a result. So the last thing that a government can afford is things getting so bad that these huge workforces can fall to what they perceive to be radical ideas because then that's how you get these revolutions to begin with. So, yes, even though the overall aims of the revolutions didn't succeed in 1848, you could say that long-term they absolutely did, because now you had these nations starting to pay more attention to, like you said, the, econ you know, the economic situation um, to ensure that things didn't get too bad, because, you know, and that's not from any sense of magnanimity necessarily from any of these governments it's you know just a form of self-preservation and that's um something that we see as well you know governments rarely bestow thing you know these you know uh, progressive reforms on a society because you know it necessarily wants to it's a form of self-preservation whether you know um whether it's winning an election or whether it's you know, maintaining economic prosperity or one, you know, one thing or another, you know, it's, it's really out of the kindness of its own heart kind of thing, you know, it's usually because it benefits in some way. The of German and Italian unification had been defeated, but made giant strides and learned crucial lessons. Their goals would not be achieved by ideas alone, but the realities of force. In the words of Bismarck, the great questions of the day were to be settled not through speeches and majority decisions, but by iron and blood. It would be wars waged by powerful monarchies that united Germany and Italy. The legacy of 1848, for good and ill, would be felt for decades to come. All right, another great video. Um, so that's, I think that was a great summary of 18 of the year of revolutions, 1848. So, um, and I think in many ways, we're still feeling the effects of that today because like I say, you know, everything in history is connected in some way, but um, particularly things that happened, you know, more recently, you know, historically speaking, at least things like this, you can see the effects of things like this today. Like, you know, the, year of revolution le leading to things like the unification of Germany, which um, in part set the stage for the First and Second World War, you know, which obviously helped to create the world that we know today. So, um, you know, it's interesting to see that we're still feeling the effects of these things even, even now. So, um, but, you know, you could say that of most events in history, but particularly something that you know, didn't only lasted for the better part of a year, you know, because you could say, well, what about something like the Roman Empire? You know, we're still feeling the effects of that today. 
true, but that lasted for thousands of years, you know. But it's, it's so it's interesting to see that a short, sharp, seismic, violent event like this, you know, can have such massive consequences. And that's always something that I found interesting about history. But, um, but anyway, let me know what you thought in the comments below. We'll be back very soon with another video, so make sure your subscribe and notifications are on. Thank you all so much for watching. I shall see you all on the next one.